I think I'd like to take a moment, because I know it's probably not going to happen this evening, but uh, I really think we should all take a minute and thank Jerry, Jerry Latman, for putting this together and, and working tirelessly to promote Ben in, ben in this region. Um, I met Jerry a few years ago and realized he is really passionate about this, so uh, great job, Jerry. Do you want to stay there? Or do you want to I'm going to stand here because really? it's the boys' club. Okay. It's just like when I grew up, you know. They're all being penalized. That's okay. There is a chair if you get tired. I will. Okay. So, um, would you like me to just introduce the folks on our panel? I know most of you folks have met them. Um, who's over at the other end? I need to. Can I walk around? I'm going to give them a mic to share. Oh, God, don't give them a mic. <laughs> you can do whatever you like. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to start over on the far end here. Frank Robertson uh, from Dexel did a wonderful job explaining how they're using BIM in their, their organization. Next hello, to him, hello. we have a, re a slight replacement. Uh, we all had the conversation earlier from the federal government, and uh, great job by Duncan. But in his place on the panel, we have Jody. Jody Eisner is going to be on the hot seat to answer all the questions that you were probably wanting to ask earlier today. No pressure, Jody. It'll be fine. Arnold Witt, a good old friend uh, from the Halifax International Airport who, who shared uh, some of the things that we were doing there. And we also have Patrick. Patrick from Elistana is going to be put on the hot seat as well because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grill him on some of the projects going, here in, uh, going on here in our region. Don't be afraid, Patrick. <laughs> OK, it'll be fine. And of course, I'm also going to reach out to Dan and ask for his input because he, he's a technology provider and he talks to a lot of partners uh, across the, the, the country and also here in our region. So I would like to start just to, to tell a few rules. So I'm a very casual speaker. And if you have some questions, I'd like you to raise your hands. I'm going to ask a couple to get things started, get everyone warmed up, but I don't want you to be shy. And I think what I'd like to do is if you'd like to ask a question, I'd like to bring the mic to you so everyone can hear you clearly. Not everyone is as loud as I am. So I'm, I'm going to start with a question for Patrick. Don't roll your eyes, Patrick. <laughs> um, my question for you is, Ellis Dawn has been involved in many, many product, products, sorry, projects in Atlantic Canada. And I'd like to know, as a project manager that covers this region and also Ottawa, what changes have you seen happening in our construction projects in the last few years? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, I, I think the biggest change is uh, is definitely the, the adoption of, of the three D modeling stuff. But typically, uh, typically it's it's more on the on the design uh, side of things, and and more so on the on the larger scale projects. Uh, but I think it was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, about hundred million or above. Um, usually, the, the smaller projects don't seem to get the uh, uh, the attention uh, that they that they deserve uh, to to have new technologies uh, brought into them, uh, and uh, definitely uh, yeah uh, a lot from the design side, and uh, I think we're going to start to see some more of the uh, subcontractors uh, uh, picking up the use of these tools uh, as well. Uh, they're going to be a bit slower behind, I think, uh, than the uh, than the bigger firms of the architects and the engineers, but. Uh, uh, I think that uh, it's going to start happening because um, people like us, like Alice Dawn, uh, we're going to start um, enforcing that. And when we're pre-qualifying our subcontractors, um, we're going to we're going to make sure that uh, we qualify them not just on their ability to perform the work, but uh, their uh, the technical technical uh, advancements as well. Awesome, thank you. Any questions in addition to that, or in relation to that? Perfect. My next question is for Jody. <laughs> so if we could pass the mic to Jody. Um, I want to say I was quite excited to, uh, to hear the information that came from Duncan earlier about the federal government's commitment to, to pushing BIM in these regions. And so Jody, my question is, you know, recognizing that, that the public sector is going to drive change in this region, what value does the government see in BIM locally from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, uh, it is actually both a local and a national perspective. First of all, uh, Duncan mentioned earlier uh, where public services and procurement are more or less the custodians of a significant amount of real property in the region. 
um, leveraging BIM and various facets of scanning, modeling, leading to full-on BIM uh, certainly will help our department and the government of Canada as a whole to really make concerted steps to achieving our greenhouse gas reduction targets. No question about that, but on a, on a bit of a more micro scale on a day-to-day -day project basis, just so everybody knows, our department handles projects in the range of anything from a $5,000 bathroom renovation in a building to a $25 million uh, design build of a new facility. It's a big broad range of things. But all that to say, throughout the, the project life cycle, there's various ways that I think this is the type of technology that we want to leverage and we should be leveraging moving forward to be better financial stewards of the taxpayer's money. So simply put, not to get too long-winded here, uh, but there's a variety of ways that from my perspective, I think we as a government can really leverage this technology and make a difference for Canadians. Awesome, thank you. Oh, wait, we have a question. I feel like a talk show host, it's awesome. Stand up, please. <laughs> Hi, Barb McDonald from NSCC. My question is related to uh, topics like lead. Is there a connection, not necessarily just for you, Jody, but is there a connection um, with Revit? I know we can do energy modeling, and it depends, the energy model is going to depend on the level of the, the model itself. But is there any kind of work happening with uh, these BIM models and, say, CAGBC to have information that is necessary for lead uh, points to be extracted kind of by pressing a button and <coughs> able to upload automatically, things like that? Since, since we are working on buildings and those components are really important. That was almost a technical question, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm glad she said it's not just for me, so everybody else gets to <laughs> no, no. play along here too, right? Um, so LEED, um, it's a big deal for the type of project that I just mentioned, a, a new design build of a new facility. Um, in general, our department will strive for the highest possible level of LEED certification, and I believe personally that there are things you can extract from the BIM models that will be more readily available to you to provide going forward for your LEED certification of that facility. It's a bit of a general answer, I know, but I'm relying on my cohorts here to <laughs> help out too. Anyone else have any feedback on, on LEED? Or, or I know that we have, we have a, a mixed panel. We should have actually for someone from, from uh, Autodesk to show up as well, just, just to put them on the spot and ask about their plans from a technology point of view. Yeah, and I can add just one more thing, I think, on that. Um, the lead certification and the whole lead process is bigger than the building itself, okay? So there are some things that I would suggest, at least from my perspective, that you may not be able to just extract as easily as you think from that model, but if you were to situate that model geographically, for example, then you could further leverage the model in conjunction with the rest of the geographic information to help you provide the lead program with data. Uh, I can't speak to that educational, educationally, um, but I will say this. I think safe to say that to the extent that data can be open, that's certainly on the government's agenda to be that way. Um, I think reasonably though, uh, there are certain facilities, at least within the federal realm, that it may not be that wise to make all the data on it open. A um, Couple of examples might be secure types of facilities like uh, an RCMP facility a national defense facility, things like that, where the government may choose to not make that sort of data to be open, and probably for very understandable reasons. Oh 
Boy, I didn't expect this many questions <laughs> in the run of the night. Um, is there a plan? I think there's the beginnings of a plan from my perspective. Uh, to be quite blunt about it though, I think there's a long way to go. Um, and there's some, some questions yet to be answered about just how that type of situation would roll out. Um, Security is only one part of that discussion. Um, networks and things like were discussed earlier, the ability to handle such volumes of data is currently still a challenge. Um, and it's still a challenge federally, for sure. But, um, but it's a known issue. And I think our leadership is looking firmly at trying to deal with that. Uh, I just don't really have the details to give you, but it, it's a known issue. Okay, Arnold, this is for you since you're... Uh-huh. <laughs> there we go. So Halifax International Airport has, has already shown leadership in this region by adding BIM requirements to your recent projects. Um, as an owner, I'm sure you've learned a lot in that first the first steps you took a few years back or a few uh, projects back learned lessons in the language you use in your contracts and about BIM in general and that that requirement. Can you share what you learned and maybe give some advice to some folks that might be considering adding the same requirements to their contracts? First thing is don't wait um, because you can have a BIM implementation plan and have you know what resources do we need, what staffing do we need. If you wait to figure all that out, you It'll be years, and you may not even start it. So if you just start into it slowly, like like I, you know, I, I do like what we've done by starting with the pilot program to find out what you don't know, uh, to see what benefits fit your business model. Um, if you had a greenfield building and someone gave you a BIM model and then you dumped it into Maxwell Facility Management, that building never changed. And if you need a new pump, you clicked on it, and you had your new pump, and you bought it, and it got ordered, and got put in, and the building never changed. That would be slick. Um, but if you're a, a renovation mill, like an airport is, then um, you know the cost savings are there on, on the build. How you maintain that information facility management, you know, means staff and resources, um, and keeping that model up to date. And that's where we are in our process. And whether our cost-benefit analysis, you know, dies with uh, the build and by passing on data instead of binders for, you know, for the project records so or for, for maintenance, okay, if we can pass on that, that data on, then at least we've done what we've traditionally done smarter, more efficiently, um, so that it doesn't get in a box and go in the basement. It actually gets in their hands immediately. So I see huge benefits in just, you know just trying to move forward and then the second part is education find out what you don't know you know, through their process or training and then you'll figure out your management requirements your staffing requirements your training needs um, so that, that's my recommendation for people that currently aren't specifying the use the second thing would be some of the things we've learned because of well development because you're actually contracting people and uh, they bid for your job, especially if you're you know, a public entity, you just can't negotiate something with your favorite contractor or designer. You have to actually tender it. So you need to know what the spec should be because you, know, you bought that service up front. You can negotiate a change, um, but it's, it's, it's more important to put that spec in on what level of development you're requiring from the contractor. And then when you hire the, the, the trade group, you need to actually specify what's, in, what's required of them. Now that, say you don't have to figure it out all the first job, you're gonna see benefits, whether you're knowledgeable or not, that you'll quickly get up to speed. And what I do recommend is the industry forum to find out who else is, where they are, um, and what they've already done, so you're gonna figure it out yourself. This is why this forum is important. Perfect, thank you. I'm going to pick on Brent now, he was, too quiet over there on the end, actually. Um, 
Brent, obviously your firm, based on your, your presentation, has already ado adopted BIM uh, and has done so on many projects or used it in the last few years. Since we already know from, from Arnold's point what the benefits of BIM are to his um, vertical as an owner, what is BIM offering to your company as an architectural firm that you can share for, for anyone that may not uh, be aware of what those benefits are? Yeah, it's adding for us um, one of the biggest things we've noticed because we have a sister company in Paramount Management is um, facility management, um, renovations to older buildings that we may have put into a model four or five years ago and we now want to update cladding or replace windows. It allows you to really pull it apart and put it back together. Um, another thing that we noticed recently is uh, the increasing amount of uh, commercial space that we put into our buildings as they change and ebb and flow when people are moving in and out we're able to pretty quickly uh, let a client know if who wants to lease a space if it's going to work for them we can do good space planning for them and there's a lot less time involved and going through that process than before. So those are a couple. Of and now Dan. <laughs> so D Dan and I have something in common. We're both salespeople. We go. To, we talk to a lot of folks in a lot of different businesses. And um, I'd like to consider myself someone who knows um, a lot of what's going on in this region. Dan covers all of Canada, correct? So. You know, BIM has certainly changed project expectations. I know we were talking about this earlier. Um, what do you see, or what are you seeing in how BIM is changing the way that multiple players work together, just by the nature of the tool that you're, tr you're uh, showing people? Sure. Um, I, 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 as I said, I've been, I've been around since Autodesk first acquired Revit, and I, I've had pro clients coordinating in BIM and uh, I know uh, a high rise with a twist that was done by one of my clients in Vancouver that did it with Revit 5 and the structural company did it with Revit Structure uh, 2. And it was an incredibly complex building and the software was not nearly as sophisticated or as evolved as it is today. And what it was in that case is we actually sat down, I was working with the reseller at the time, and um, we sat down with the owner of the project, we sat down with the architects, we sat down with the engineers on the project, and made sure that everybody understood the value that they were getting out of being able to work with them. Because right away when you bring a new technology in, we already know that there's gonna be a bunch of complexities involved with the, the expense of the software, integrating it into your infrastructure, making sure your personnel are trained, and that was even before a time that there was clear a clear cut BIM execution plan, or and most people didn't have a lot of established families to work with. So over the course of time, what I've seen is that more of the stakeholders are understanding the value of having BIM all for lack of a better word, talking to each other so that we can have this project and now this works and we can run clashes on it and we can get information out of that project. Well, every one of these steps require more players to put more information into it. So from my perspective, the biggest thing that gets buy-in and coordination is for each of the players to not just feel like they're being mandated to move in that direction, but for each of the players to understand the value they are going to have by integrating this more complicated process in. And in, like I said, Revit has been, Autodesk has had Revit now for over 15 years. This is, this is, isn't new. But when you deal with areas, and I, and I've worked in Vancouver and I've worked in Toronto, but I'm also from New Brunswick, and I know what it's like for a small organization Especially, let's look at a, an electrical contractor who's making a small margin on a project. It's been really hard for that that uh, organization in a small project to take on the investment of the technology, the investment of the training for their little piece of the pie to grade in 3D because everybody wants it in 3D. So they've got to have a clear cut set of values to decide to it. 
perhaps it's as simple as being able to say, I want to participate in the Halifax Airport project, so I need to be able to do this a bit to be able to uh, respond to this RFP. But that's what I've seen with, with coordination is it's it's a buy-in, but it all comes down to you as an organization have to identify the value that you have. And then when you start to work with other people, I sell coordination software and I see it every day with hundreds of thousands of issues that happen where you're able to start to centralize that communication. You're able to look at how your changes are being impacted by others, other people's changes. Then we get the advantage of solving problems by moving pixels instead of solving problems that we find exciting at the expense of that intention. Perfect, thank you. I'm actually going to put everyone on the spot for this next question that you didn't have any idea was coming. So, and I'm going to start at this end, Dan, because I'm just being cruel. <laughs> no, um, I want, the one question I get all the time is, where is Atlanta, Canada in BIM? I have people that say it's not being adopted. I have people that say it is. It depends on who you're working with, what projects you've participated in. So I'm going to ask everyone, based on your knowledge of the projects that you've seen, where is Atlantic Canada in placing BIM adoption in Canada? Are we in the middle? Are we at the very end, meaning we're the latest adopters? Are we anywhere near the top? So on a range from one to five being, one is we're early adopters, five being we're at the end of the pack, where are we? Well, as I said, most of the time I work with urban, with urban centers in, uh, in Canada. So a lot of my exposure to what's going on in the Maritimes has a lot to do with the conversations I've had on this trip. So I don't feel like I can give a one to five, but what I can say is that, that I've seen lots of organizations decide to make the investment in the event and be amazed at how quickly you can go from being a newbie in your business to being somebody who's really good at it. If you've got the will and you've got identified a value to become a, a BIM practitioner, you can become very good very quickly. And then it doesn't matter how, how your neighbors or a geography is, you can start competing for some of the best projects that are out there and you will start to work with other BIM champions and you will only get better at it as a result. Okay, Patrick. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, the, the Atlantic region does have uh, that reputation of being a little bit farther behind um, the, the, the rest of the country. Uh, and, you know, I started my career with Elston about seven and a half years ago, uh, and it was in Toronto. Uh, then I moved to Ottawa. And even the difference between those two cities, Toronto is much further advanced. Even moving to Ottawa a few, year, a few years ago, uh, they were farther behind uh, in, than Toronto. But over the last couple of years, they've started to pick up steam, and, and it's a lot more uh, representative there. Uh, and, and now I'm, I'm just getting involved with the Atlantic region, and I've sort of seen where Ottawa was uh, just a few years ago, and uh, they're, they're, they're primed for, for just uh, picking it up and running with it. And the other regions, like Toronto and Vancouver, uh, sort of paved the way. Uh, you know, we've worked out the kinks. We know how, how those areas know how, uh, how it works. Uh, so now I think it, uh, it's a lot easier to be adopted uh, in this region, and I think it's going to happen uh, very rapidly within the next few years. Thank you. Arnold, you've talked to some other airports, I'm sure, and, and had this conversation during your education on, on BIM and, and what it means for you. What do you think? So what I've found is, um, especially when we're in need, you know, an airport planning component to all of our design work, we usually deal with national design firms. So I found that they're more advanced in, in uh, BIM than the construction industry locally is because they, they do that in different parts of the country. And uh, so we'll have the planners come in and do the local engineering groups that do the detailed design. And there's you know cross migration of, of this information within their companies because they work on projects across the country as well as locally. So um, I found uh, that during the design coordination, I don't, I don't see any difference. It's integrated. On, on the contract and inside of the local consultant team, they don't seem to be there as much as their colleagues in you know, the national centers. Um, and, then, and then when you get to the contractors, the big guys, they've got their teams. Um, 
you know, in the major centers, and they've got their offices locally. Um, so, um, so what they, I think, with how that can advance more rapidly is, is that needs to be that you know they've got lunch and learns workshops. And the local construction industry needs to learn from the national companies, but we also need to advance you know, the, the local contractors that aren't national um, because they have the most to benefit. Right. Oh, I agree. Perfect. Thank you. Jody, I'm sure you have similar input that you can share with us. Um, a little, probably. Okay. Not a significant amount. If I had to put a number on your scale, though, to yeah. start, I think I'm, in my opinion anyway, I'm, I'm in line with, with my colleagues here. This region is probably a little bit more behind. Mm -hmm. But I've seen also the the impact that the bigger national companies like uh, are referred to in in playing a role in bringing us in this region in terms of advancement much more rapidly. I think it's to come. Um, my take on it right now is regionally we're probably a little bit behind, but. I also don't think that that's our fault. I think that the opportunity in the bigger markets like Toronto, Vancouver, and others um, have really driven that technology further there. Um, bigger gains to be had there initially, uh, but I think we're we're going to make progress here. That's my thank thing. you. No, I agree. I uh, I look at it this way: Atlanta, Canada, we might be a little bit behind in, in competing with the larger national firms, but uh, they had to pay for that education and we're learning from them. So uh, I think that there's a benefit to, to being smaller and stronger. Brent, what about you? What do you think? I would say that there's there's definitely pockets of people who are really kind of pushing the envelope in large, large scale and in small scale, but uh, I would agree that in the near future there's going to be a a really steep curve of everybody picking it up and people really sharing and communicating a lot more. So I would say 4.5. Perfect. No, I think uh, all, all that really tells me is it's only going to get better. So folks, to be respectful of your time, we uh, if there's no other questions, I'm going to stop our panel discussion. I do want to mention that we do have some folks that are have been set up out in the hallway all evening to, to speak with you, hoping you'll come and see their wares. I'm one of them, but that's fine. <laughs> no pressure. Um, I'm going to pass this back to Jerry, and I thank you very much.